I have a bit of a task ahead of me because I'm trying to explain uh, some uh, new electrical engineering and some new science that is uh, just emerging. And because it's so new, uh, it, it will uh, be a privilege for me to maybe introduce it to you, but also it will be uh, rather uh, challenging uh, because uh, it's something that uh, we're all just learning for the first time, including myself, my students, and uh, various researchers around the world. And so uh, the concept is uh, that we will use machines to solve a, a major computer science problems. Uh, now, you might ask what this has to do with optics. I'll indicate it uh, very shortly. Uh, but uh, uh, you'll see that uh, throughout uh, the uh, human endeavor these days, it's very important to, to do optimization. So I'll start uh, with showing you some examples. Uh, I'll give the first example is silicon photonics, which emerged uh, uh, recently and has become uh, a very important factor in industry. Uh, in fact, uh, we're, we're, we're speaking together uh, on the internet, uh, and uh, it just so happens that uh, uh, the internet goes through data centers, and in data centers, they have internal communication, and most of the internal communication is by uh, silicon photonics. So let me underline that. Uh, now, uh, because it's so heavily used uh, in uh, uh, data centers, uh, the company, which I was a co-founder, uh, Luxterra was purchased by Cisco for a very large sum of money. And uh, now uh, this is the dominant uh, means of internal communication inside data centers. So if you have checked your email today or downloaded a web page you have uh, inadvertently uh, used a photonic crystal. I'll show you uh, what kind it is. First, I'll uh, mention uh, what does the product look like. Well, it, it looks like a cable, and it's, it's like a USB cable, but these are not USB plugs. Uh, these are rather uh, uh, special plugs. They plug into an electrical outlet, but inside this little bulge, it's all converted into light, and this yellow cable is actually an optical fiber. So that yellow cable goes round and round. And uh, uh, it uh, is the way that uh, you have internal communication uh, inside uh, data centers. And, and it has a name, it's called optical active cable. That is to say, it's uh, it looks like an electrical cable to the user, but it, it, inside the plug, it gets converted to optical pulses. Now inside every one of those is a, a two-dimensional photonic crystal and let me uh, give you an idea why that's needed. When you send the signal through an optical fiber, every time the optical fiber is twisted around uh, some obstruction, uh, the optical polarization changes. So the, by the time the signal is received, it includes both polarizations. And, and the two polarizations have to be separated and amplified separately uh, uh, in order to uh, convert it into a, a signal. So it works out that if you have a two-dimensional photonic crystal, uh, this is going to uh, scatter the light this way. And the other dimension of this uh, sort of grading coupler will scatter the light this way. And so in this way, the uh, two, uh, the, the two uh, polarizations are uh, nicely separated and they get sent into uh, separate waveguides. This shows only a single waveguide, uh, but uh, uh, you see here there are actually uh, two waveguides, and it, and it gets nicely uh, separated that way. So this is a, a kind of a neat trick, and it relies upon these little islands. So the uh, this part is uh, silicon, and the darker part in between is silicon dioxide. So you have enough index contrast uh, to uh, be able to call it a photonic crystal. And this is in every chip, in every data center, and uh, we're probably using it right now for this um, uh, uh, Google meeting call. Now, one of the issues is designing those structures that I showed you. There are so many uh, uh, different functions that have to be designed. It's uh, modulators, detectors, splitters, and so forth. And uh, so uh, there's a need to uh, design it. And uh, what has emerged is something that uh, we should all learn, and uh, I wish I had learned it when I was an undergraduate, is something called shape calculus. So you optimize the shape of the uh, structure 
uh, to fulfill your objectives. And uh, so how do you optimize it? You take the derivative as you always do in calculus, and uh, but you're differentiating with respect to shape. And then you want to go to the optimum point and all the derivatives become uh, zero at the optimum point and you, then you have the optimal shape. And I'll show you how that's done. Uh, here's an example of a simple splitter. And it starts out as a uh, rather uh, uh, conventional looking splitter, but then you adjust the uh, region where the splitting takes place in order to have the lowest insertion loss. And in this case, uh, uh, you're going through uh, many iterations. Well, it's actually uh, 30 iterations. You're starting with 70% uh, efficiency and you're going up uh, toward uh, close to 99% efficiency. This is the merit function. And let me go to the next slide, which just shows a, a just a single optimization scan. And uh, the calculation starts here and ends here at 98.9% uh, 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 efficiency, which is, which is quite good. And the shape that you end up with is rather uh, non-intuitive. I don't think you could have necessarily guessed that shape. The initial guess was a, a straight ramp, but uh, the, um, the straight ramp was not very good. And this odd shape is actually... Uh, 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 very close to 99% efficiency. So this is an example of uh, using uh, shape optimization or shape calculus to achieve a desired result. And the problem with shapes is that a shape could have uh, many uh, hundreds or thousands of parameters to, to define a shape. Uh, in principle, you have to define every point in space and, and uh, each one might be different to optimize the shape. So uh, a method arose, and it arose a long time ago, maybe it was uh, 60 years ago, called adjoint optimization uh, for doing something remarkable, and that is uh, to optimize with respect to a very large number of variables. Now, you know, as freshmen in calculus, we learn how to optimize with respect to one variable. And uh, every, every freshman is taught that, uh, how to reach the maximum or the minimum of a function just by taking the derivative and setting it to zero. But uh, what if it were two variables? So then, then it's more difficult. Well, actually, we have a way of doing it. Even if there are thousands of variables, there's a way to uh, find the optimum with respect to thousands, maybe even a million variables. And this is called uh, the adjoint method. At least that's the name I like to use for it. Uh, and uh, it's um, useful for uh, shape optimization. But once you're doing optimization, there are many other areas of science where you need optimization. Uh, for example, in control theory, uh, in artificial intelligence backpropagation, and more generally in machine learning, you're always uh, doing uh, optimization. So what does it entail? It entails a figure of merit, something you're trying to optimize, and uh, you, um, uh, uh, you, the figure of merit might depend upon electric field, might depend upon magnetic field, but it most specifically depends upon the design variables. And so these, I'm calling these P, and there could be uh, thousands of them. And uh, so how are you going to get the derivative of the merit function with respect to all those thousands of variables. So there's a trick. Let me show you the trick. Suppose you go ahead and solve Maxwell's equations. And I have a, a shorthand for Maxwell's equations. The Maxwell operator, I just have bold M, and the electric and magnetic fields are just there. And then the uh, driving currents, I call them J. So this is uh, one solution of Maxwell's equations. And then I have uh, uh, a more strange solution. Uh, that uh, introduces uh, uh, V as, as the unknown solution, but driving V is uh, the derivative of the merit function with respect to the uh, electric fields. So you can set up a second Maxwell equation. It's called an adjoint simulation because it's, it's as if you're uh, solving uh, backwards in time, uh, or uh, in, in specifically there's a transpose and of course, the trick relies very heavily upon linear algebra to handle those thousands of variables. But if you solve for the electric field and you solve for this adjoint solution V, uh, then you can uh, actually determine the derivative of the merit function at all points in space. 
uh, you just take the um, uh, the uh, dot product between that vector. And let's see if this will work. Okay, there's a dot, and there's a dot. And uh, so, and this is the Maxwell operator uh, differentiated with respect to the merit functions, not to the merit function, but with respect to the design variables. And uh, uh, by having two solutions of Maxwell's equations, these are the two fairly straightforward solutions. Uh, you can actually get the derivative of a merit function at all points in space. And this is okay. So uh, reminder that in your first calculus, you learned how to find the maximum of a single function of one variable. And by adding linear algebra to calculus, you can even optimize a, a million variables all simultaneously. So this is rather remarkable. And uh, this is explained in this uh, paper, but it's kind of old news in the sense it was applied to many different fields. Uh, and uh, I'll show you an ex uh, example from optics that's more recent. Uh, the optical people discovered this form of optimization relatively recently, uh, but the optics started with uh, photolithography. And uh, this was about uh, 20 years ago, when uh, you make uh, chips, electronic chips, you make them by photography. And so uh, we were uh, producing the chips and we were producing features that were smaller than the electromagnetic wavelength. So uh, you see the features here are 55 nanometers in size, and the electromagnetic wavelength that is universal use is 193 nanometers. So uh, the question is, what shape in the negative uh, will actually produce the correct image on the silicon? So it's rather surprising. Uh, this is the image you're trying to produce, and uh, the, uh, uh, the shape of the mask or the negative is completely counterintuitive. Uh, it's this very odd, strange shape, and uh, it's it's non-intuitive. Uh, it's an early form of metasurface. It was around 2000, and uh, this was actually commercialized by a company that I also co-founded, Luminescent Technologies, and we used exactly this mathematics. We kept ad adjusting uh, the shape until it gave exactly the right pattern when it was projected through uh, the... Uh, uh, photographic system and, and through the uh, uh, photographic uh, resist. And I would say in general, the shapes are rather non-intuitive. Uh, these are uh, for different uh, resolutions. Uh, you ended up with shapes that didn't look very much like the, your target, but actually gave you exactly uh, the target image that you were uh, aiming for. So these were, these were early examples of this adjoint simulation or adjoint optimization. So how important is optimization to our daily life? Well, uh, most recently it's used for uh, deep learning where it's called backpropagation. You have to optimize matrix elements so that they give you a desired result. For example, in, uh, in identifying object in an image, uh, you, uh, you, you train it with by showing it many pictures of dogs and cats and other animals. And uh, it uh, works backward and figures out what matrix will operate on the photograph and tell you, uh, yes, it's a dog or uh, yes, it's a cat. Uh, this is uh, one of many examples. Uh, of course, in circuit wiring, there's optimization. In packing, there's optimization. In uh, proton folding and in control theory, and uh, well, especially in computer vision. Okay, but let me show you some more examples of optimization. Uh, and that is, uh, well, in the United States, uh, the Amazon truck is very uh, common. Uh, they deliver everywhere. They, live, uh, they deliver multiple times a day. And uh, the, the question arises uh, whether, uh, what path? Uh, the, the driver has to know the sequence of customers that he should be attending to. And uh, this is a form of optimization. Now, even if uh, the driver, if you save him just a few kilometers uh, at the end of the day, uh, multiplied by the number of trucks all over the world, it would be, uh, that's a very hard uh, uh, optimization problem. It's very similar to the traveling salesman problem where he's trying to find, the salesman is trying to find his optimum path, 
Well, the salesmen are not that fussy, but uh, certainly the Amazon trucks are uh, very fussy. And I'm just wondering, can someone tell me if Amazon is uh, 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 notorious in India as well? If you could, if you could unmute yourself, I, I, I'm. Uh, I think this is a very compelling example yeah. in which you can. Yeah, yeah, very much. Uh, there, are, there, are, and so the, the same issue comes up all over the world, yeah. uh, and of course there are other optimizations, uh, scheduling of jet planes. Uh, in the financial industry, you want to optimize uh, the return for the least amount of risk, and in aerodynamics and civil engineering, the civil engineers were using the echoing method uh, commercially uh, 35 years ago. But uh, even long before then, in control theory, uh, they were also using the adjoint optimization. So whenever you have a large number of variables that you have to optimize. So the, what this talk is about is a recognition that physics does optimization. There are, there are other ways of, of doing this. And the, uh, you, you, you manipulate the uh, matrices and you do the linear algebra, but it just so happens that physics has many principles that are expressed as a minimum or a maximum. Uh, and uh, there's a, a famous principle of least time, that light will travel the path that takes the least time. Um, it's a subset of the least action. So that's in the Feynman lectures, he explains action and that the, the physical world is always trying to follow the path of the least action. But in, in the case of light, that just works out to be the shortest path or the path that takes the least time. And as an example, if you have a lifeguard and is trying to save a swimmer, what the lifeguard will do, it will run as far as they can on the sand and then she will jump into the water. She cannot swim as fast as she can run, uh, but to minimize the amount of time in order to reach uh, the drowning swimmer uh, just in time. And, and this is exactly the same law of refraction that you find in optics, is that if you have uh, uh, a high refractive index medium, the light follows this sort of path, and then it refracts into the lower uh, refractive index medium. And uh, I think I said that in the opposite way. The higher refractive index medium is where you, the, the speed of light is slower. Okay, and uh, so this is one minimization principle in physics. Uh, I'll give you a, a bunch of them because you can see that there are many things in physics. Suppose, for example, you had uh, a circuit and the current would branch into two branches. The branches are identical, uh, but the branches being identical, you'd be very shocked if one branch took two thirds of the current and the other branch took one third of the current. Uh, so if you had two thirds of the current going through one resistor, uh, that would increase the power dissipation. Uh, so uh, if you ask what is the lowest power dissipation is when the current divides exactly uh, equally. I don't know how this red mark got here. Let's see. Now the red mark is still there. Well, um, the idea then is that uh, circuits uh, tend to um, uh, tend to uh, dissipate the least amount of power. Now, this is not uh, the, uh, the same idea as the least amount of energy. This is the least amount of power dissipation. So it's very different. Of course, systems also want to minimize the energy. Let's see, and I don't know why I have this red mark here. Uh, I suppose I can probably erase it. Let's see. Well, it doesn't matter. We're not coming back to that slide. Whoops. Oh my. Okay, so uh, there's another principle, and and this is the principle that this is like for multiple lasers uh, or multiple modes that all the uh, power will go into the mode with the uh, lowest amount of loss. And so uh, let me uh, play that again for you. And so you have many modes on the horizontal axis, and then finally all of the power ends up in the mode with the least loss. So this is a way that physics will automatically find 
uh, the mode with the least loss. Every laser does this. It finds the mode that has the least loss. Uh, here's another minimization principle in physics, and uh, that is the uh, variational principle of quantum mechanics. It says if you have a trial wave function in red, so this is the red wave function, and say, so, oh, uh, well, uh, if I figure out the energy, the trial wave function has too much energy. So I try to keep adjusting and readjusting the wave function until I get the lowest energy in uh, Schrodinger's equation. And that would be the green wave function. So this is also an optimization principle. You have to optimize uh, the uh, shape of the wave function. This is geometry again. The shape of the wave function needs to be optimized to give you the least amount of uh, uh, or the wave function that has the lowest energy. So it's yet another optimization principle. And this is uh, uh, this is uh, an interesting one, uh, but this is the most common one: is that the uh, a system has to go to the lowest energy state. And what emerged, of course, it's actually very difficult to find the lowest energy state. Uh, what emerged from, and this is called physical annealing, what emerged was uh, simulated annealing, which is a uh, computer science program that says, well, you might get stuck in the local minimum, but you, uh, you allow it to have a finite temperature, so it jumps out of the local minimum, goes into the next local minimum, and finally, if you gradually lower the temperature, you'll find the absolute minimum. And uh, this is nothing wrong with this, uh, but it does tend to be very slow because you do get stuck in the local minimum. So that, that's the idea that the first thing you learn uh, in, in physical science is that everything likes to go to the lowest energy. So, uh, th so those are optimization principles. Here's one that's of a different character. Not exactly an optimization principle. It's called the adiabatic method, and it is used. Uh, sometimes people have quantum computers that use the adiabatic method, uh, but it's actually something that also works in classical uh, uh, machines. And the idea is that uh, you have a complicated circuit with, um, uh, let's say, many inductors and uh, couplings. And uh, you, you might have a, a simple solution where there are no couplings. You can easily find, uh, figure out what the uh, 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 optimal solution is. But then you turn on all the couplings. And uh, the couplings uh, give you avoided crossing. So as you turn them on, you might think that the system would continue on like that. But it doesn't. It has an avoided crossing. And so the avoided crossing uh, then uh, uh, forces the system to stay in the ground state. And you go forth, and then there's another avoided crossing, but you stay in the ground state. And this enables you to find the ground state of a very hard problem. It's called the adiabatic method. It's a respected method, but it is not as commonly used as uh, uh, one of the methods I've just shown you. So I, sh I just showed you um, at least six methods for using physics to solve optimization problems. I also motivated it. That this, is, this, this is one of the most important things in uh, mathematics and in computer science is to get optimization. And this shows you physics does the optimization for you because it has so many principles that are maximizing or minimizing something. And so of all of these principles, it appears that the most useful one and the most common one is number one. It's the principle of least entropy generation, but that's complicated, entropy is complicated. So I'll just say it's the principle of least power dissipation. A driven circuit or any driven system will tend to readjust the heat flows, the currents, readjust everything just to minimize the power dissipation, but subject to the constraint that it's being driven. And, uh, and this comes up over and over again, and I'll show you some examples. Uh, of uh, different groups in the past 10 years who have uh, done this. Uh, so uh, uh, here's a, a way to think about it. Uh, and uh, perhaps I, I should give you the, uh, the standard problem that everybody solves. And that is if you have many magnets, imagine the magnets are sitting on a table and they're all interacting. What configuration of the magnets are the lowest magnetic energy? And uh, so uh, that's actually an extraordinarily difficult problem. 
uh, the uh, energy can be written uh, this way. And the magnet, just think of the magnets either having magnet up or magnet down or spin up or spin down. And these coefficients tell you whether they like to be both parallel or anti-parallel. So this would be uh, ferromagnetic coupling, that they all want to be parallel. Anti-ferromagnetic coupling, they all want to be anti-parallel. And so these couplings, we can say that the, they're either plus or minus one, and that makes uh, uh, makes it a uh, rather uh, uh, well-defined problem, and uh, everybody tries to solve it. And so this is sort of an example. You think of your magnet as a bistable element, and uh, it could be a little circuit, or uh, so there, there are many bistable elements in physics, and then you couple them. In this case, we're coupling them with resistors, but you could couple them with inductors, it doesn't matter. And uh, they will organize themselves. Since they're bistable, you'll end up with a digital answer. So this is a very important point to keep in mind. Even though it's a physics machine, it does not give you analog answers. It gives you digital answers. And this is good because the world is digital. We need to be compatible with the world. So I say, well, how could that be? Well, even the flip-flop is a physics machine. And there's no guarantee that it has, uh, that it's either flipped or flopped. Uh, in fact, it could be at some intermediate states, but then it evolves and locks in uh, to either state. And we build these machines the same way as we, we have bistable elements, we'll end up with a digital answer just like a flip flop, except there, there are going to be many flip flops. Uh, so uh, this is the icing problem. Now, I'll show you one method. I like this method because it can be made up of circuits. And that is, uh, that, uh, suppose we have uh, an LC circuit, uh, two LC circuits, and they could be oscillating in phase or they could be oscillating out of phase. If the coupling is parallel, they will tend to oscillate in phase because then the voltage will be the same here and here, and there'll be a uh, little or no voltage applied to the resistor and the dissipation will be minimum which is what I said, there's this principle, minimum power dissipation. Oh, I forgot to mention who came up with this idea of minimum power dissipation. It's a rather controversial idea, but it was put forward in 1931 by a theoretical physicist, Lars Onsager. And uh, ever since 1931, people have been very suspicious uh, and they are questioning whether it's really true and uh, on the other hand, uh, Feynman has a page in the Feynman lectures where he praises uh, the Onsager principle highly. So I, I've also praised it, and it, I'll in fact show you that's what everybody uses. So uh, now, if you have anti ferromagnetic coupling, you can set that up by crossing the resistors, and then the two oscillators have to be uh, out of phase. So how do we set up these oscillators to have either uh, positive or negative phase. So I have to introduce uh, something called uh, parametric gain. Uh, parametric gain is when you have a parameter like the capacitor in the LC circuit, that, per that parameter oscillates. Now uh, you can, uh, for example, there's a, a type of capacitor that you can adjust with a voltage. It's called a varactor. And if you apply a voltage at two omega, the capacitor will oscillate at uh, two omega. Uh, now, uh, it turns out that uh, this is something that every one of you has probably experienced as children. If you were on a swing uh, and you, uh, the, the, the child on the swing can, knows how to move his legs to uh, modulate the moment of inertia at two omega, and then you get gain and the child can end up swinging with very high amplitude, even though nobody is pushing. And, uh, but this is a very unusual type of amplifier because cosine waves get amplified, but sine waves get de-amplified. So if you're in the complex plane, you can have a plus cosine wave and a minus cosine waves, and these get amplified. And uh, the other ones up here and down here get de-amplified. And so it's a, it's a, a rather unusual type of amplifier. And this amplification occurs not at two omega, but at omega. Uh, now, uh, so uh, this is a bistable oscillator because it tends to have either 
a plus cosine solution or a minus cosine solution. So that counts as our bistable system. And uh, you're modulating at two omega, uh, but you're getting gain at omega. So you can see the period of uh, the, um, the oscillation is actually within one period. You have two oscillations of the capacitor. And, uh, and of course, it only applies to the cosine. The cosine grows, but the sine wave just sort of uh, attenuates away. And so that's our bistable system. And uh, there are many groups using the parametric oscillator as a bistable system. I should mention that in optics, we have parametric oscillators, and it's a big deal in optics. So uh, what you do is you, uh, uh, you have the capacitor be a reactor. And uh, you, uh, uh, what you're trying to do is that you want the, the time derivative of power to match the energy of the system. So uh, the energy, the icing Hamiltonian, I already indicated to you, is just a, uh, a, a sum over these ferromagnetic and antiferromagnetic couplings. Uh, but uh, the, uh, for us, uh, the important point is that the power dissipation, it's like I squared R. So it has, it has squares, it has the product, uh, has the product of uh, the two spins. So the current is acting like, uh, like a spin. The current in the circuit uh, is bistable. It acts like the spin, it can be spin up or spin down. And the power dissipation formula, I squared R, looks exactly like the icing Hamiltonian. But keep in mind, this one is a time derivative of energy, and this one, the, and the icing Hamiltonian is just an energy. But if we can make that correspondence, uh, then the circuit will solve the icing problem for us. The icing problem is a very hard problem, how to set up all the different magnets. Now, I should mention to you in passing that when you do optimization, you often have constraints functions. And uh, let's say you're trying to get an optimum of this blue, uh, these blue dashed isocontours. So uh, you're trying to get an optimum and you wanna go as close as so you follow the derivative to go to the peak, but then there's a constraint. Uh, the constraint is the red line is the constraint function. This is in two dimensions. And the constraint function is going to stop you from getting all the way to the optimum. And uh, so what happens is you go as far as you can uh, that's the point, the closest you can get to the optimum. And at that point, the gradient of the blue curve, which is the merit function, is uh, opposite and uh, with a constant uh, to the gradient of the merit function. And this gives rise to this situation and this constant of proportionality. Uh, this is the uh, uh, Lagrange multiplier. So this is a, a justification for the ideas of, of Lagrange. Well, in optimization, we do this. You get, you get this for free. If you design uh, your physical system correctly, you can have no trouble uh, uh, including constraints. And in fact, the biggest constraint is, for example, you apply a certain voltage, a fixed voltage, or you apply a fixed current, or is another constraint uh, that you only want plus or minus answers. So that, that's yet another constraint. And so you follow the gradient up to the top of the mountain, and uh, you, you do your optimization that way. And, and this is the gradient. And the optimum is achieved when the gradient is equal to zero, including the Lagrange multiplier. So, of course, you go to a global optimum, the gradient is zero. This, uh, you get to the top, there's no slope anymore. And so uh, that's the secret. Now, I should mention here in the United States, uh, this type of computing, the physics-based computing, uh, is uh, receiving a lot of scrutiny lately. And uh, there's a defense funding agency called DARPA, and they have uh, requested proposals because they think this is an important new area of technology, but they were searching around for a name. Uh, and uh, of course they were supporting a lot of work on quantum computing, but this seems to be classical computing. So to make the connection with their previous uh, uh, funding, uh, they called it quantum inspired, but it's actually uh, completely classical computing. Uh, I think foreigners are not necessarily uh, uh, going to be successful in their proposals, but the proposals are due in early December. So let me show you uh, some examples of researchers around the world who've made these physics machines that solve the icing problem. 
Uh, now, one of the most prominent is uh, Professor Roy Chowdhury, uh, Jagjit Roy Chowdhury, uh, my colleague here at Berkeley, and he uh, made these oscillators, but he didn't interpret them in terms of parametric oscillators, but rather uh, injection locking, that he was injecting to omega and it tended to lock uh, at uh, either zero phase or 180 degrees phase, and they were connected by resistors. They could have been connected other ways. But here is a circuit that mimics a magnetic system. So the circuit is minimizing the power dissipation. The magnetic system is minimizing uh, the actual energy. So uh, this is kind of neat, uh, but there's a merit function there. And uh, there's the merit function, You're, and uh, the, uh, uh, the injection locking is expressed uh, in this way, you're trying to lock two phases together. And uh, so it's, um, it's, it's an example of uh, the uh, Lagrange optimization. Uh, let me show you another example from Cambridge University in England. And uh, this one is uh, not electrical, it's optical. Uh, you have, let's say, five vertical cavities, and they're adjacent to one another. Uh, each one is carrying an electromagnetic mode, and the electromagnetic mode can be in phase or out of phase with the adjacent um, uh, uh, modes, and uh, they will actually end up solving uh, an icing problem as well. Uh, they, you could work either with phase or you can work with the direction of polarization. Uh, now, this was a very difficult experiment because it needed four degrees Kelvin. But I just showed you an example of an ordinary room temperature machine doing exactly the same thing. And they're also trying to optimize something which has to do with the uh, overlap of the uh, electric fields from the adjacent uh, 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 vertical cavity structures. Uh, here's one that has, it's maybe one of the older ones, it's about 10 years old, and uh, it has been uh, promoted by uh, Professor Yamamoto uh, from uh, Stanford, and he he literally made optical parametric oscillators. I showed you the parametric oscillators are bistable, so they're they're very handy for giving uh, digital answers. And he set it up uh, in, with time multiplex, so he had pulses going around a ring, an optical fiber ring, and each pulse, according to its phase, would interact with the uh, adjacent pulses. And to guarantee the interaction, uh, the signal was uh, tapped off, uh, sent into an electrical circuit, which then uh, introduced the inter interaction and then reintroduced it, uh, inject injected it back into the main loop in such a way that the uh, it caused uh, a mutual interaction between uh, the adjacent uh, pulse pulses. And so it's, uh, it's exactly what we call for. And, and of course, the circuit then tries to minimize the power dissipation. And in minimizing the power dissipation, it is actually uh, equivalent to uh, uh, minimizing the, uh, the magnetic energy. And this is more or less the classical part of the circuit. Uh, now, uh, Yamamoto has been telling people that this is, uh, uh, this is quantum mechanical. I think uh, perhaps not. And uh, perhaps it's following Onsager's principle. So let's move on. Uh, this is from MIT. They have uh, uh, they, they have uh, uh, several concepts of using silicon photonics for optimization. Uh, they had, there are spin-off companies that are uh, trying to do back propagation that could be useful for artificial intelligence. But uh, here's a, an example, just uh, the type of optimization we're talking about. Uh, we have uh, uh, we can set up in silicon photonics. There's a theorem. That you can use these two by two splitters or beam splitters can actually give you any unitary operation. So you have the, these unitary operations. You can set up any arbitrary unitary op operation. And then you, you pass the result uh, through some uh, uh, nonlinear filter. It could be just a, a saturating filter. And uh, then you send the output back to the input and then it iterates a second time and each time it iterates it reduces the amount of power dissipated and in this way it actually does onsager uh, optimization 
but this is yet an, a different way of doing it. Uh, and it, it doesn't rely upon parametric oscillators. It just relies upon the silicon photonics uh, uh, being um, fed back around. And so it, it, it gets fed, fed back around and it works the way all these things work. You iteratively climb a mountain until you get to the optimum. And so if you go through a uh, series of iterations as the signal goes round and round, and the, the system adjusts the relative phases of the different pulses to minimize the power dissipation. So that's rather interesting. So uh, this is reiterating that point is that we're minimizing the power dissipation and, and if you want to call it a fancy name, entropy generation. Uh, that's what Onsager called it is entropy generation, but uh, in this case, it's just the heat dissipated in the resistors. And uh, this this works uh, perfectly well. I'll show you some examples. Here's an example of 32 spins or 32 magnets in a circle, and they can interact. They're 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 fully connected. All of them are interconnected with all the others, and some of the interconnections are. Uh, ferromagnetic, and this to say the phases like to be the same, or anti-ferromagnetic, the wires are crossed and the phases want to be different. And so uh, if you ask in a problem of this type, and by the way, the solution, this is the, the solution uh, as it works out. Uh, for a simple case, all random binary weights. And uh, let me show you how it works. It, it starts running and we need to have a little bit of gain. So we, uh, we have the gain ramp. The gain ramp is the capacitance modulation at two omega. And uh, so we have 12% modulation, 12 and a half, 13% modulation. That's, that's, uh, that's giving you considerable gain. And what happens if you follow all the different oscillators, after about uh, 400 nanoseconds, they tend to lock either uh, at the positive phase or negative phase. It's very surprising. And uh, so I'll show you another example that this shows the actual phases uh, locking. Now, these oscillators are set up to be uh, centered at one gigahertz with a bandwidth of 100 megahertz. So the 400 nanoseconds represents about 40 clock cycles. And after about 40 clock cycles, uh, the uh, the phases are locked, pretty much locked. There's a little something afterward, but uh, you get the answer very quickly. So to give you an idea of how amazing this is, uh, if you plot all the possible icing energies that might exist, all the different spin configurations. Uh, so there are, uh, this, in this example, there were 33 million possible solutions. Each one is represented by a blue dot. You see some blue dots up here, but there's only one lowest solution. It's down here. That's the lowest of all the possible energies. And uh, this circuit converged on that solution and, and we've uh, we've done it also for two billion possible solutions. The same thing, except there are too many dots you can't see them. But it all comes down to what is the lowest possible power dissipation. And uh, you you're searching through two billion possibilities in approximately 40 clock cycles. So that's uh, completely amazing. So uh, let me summarize: is that I've shown you a number of physical machines from different groups. And I want to tell you, each of these groups is very possessive about their machine. They're convinced that only their machine can possibly work. Uh, but uh, we published a paper, I'll give you the uh, link in a minute, uh, a paper, we analyzed all these different cases and even a couple more, and showed that they were all uh, basically following Onsager's principle. Uh, so um, they, they, whether it was electrical, or uh, whether it was in an optical fiber or in a silicon photonics uh, or uh, coupled uh, vertical cavity uh, oscillators, uh, it's all just trying to minimize the power dissipation. So that's the fundamental rule. They're all doing the same thing. Now, if they're all doing the same thing, the easiest thing is just to do it electrically. And so I think that's sort of a recognition that is uh, now uh, dawning on many of these groups. So let me show you an example. There, there's a uh, Professor Kim of the University of Minnesota. Uh, he's a, a chip designer. He designs circuits. And he designed a circuit 
And what, what the chip designers often do is they put in ring oscillators uh, as tests for how fast the transistors are. But in this case, he put in uh, over a thousand ring oscillators on the chip, which you can barely make out. And each ring oscillator was either locking into a zero phase or pi phase. And uh, they, uh, they end up in this kind of a structure, uh, the spiral structure, if you look at it, and uh, it's, it's red, so it's a little hard to see, but this is a spiral structure. It's hard to see my pen, uh, but these spiral structures in the case of magnets are called skirmions. And up to now, they had only been seen for uh, magnets. And now he's ma he made uh, electrical simulation of the magnets. And he made the electrical simulation by designing uh, over a thousand ring oscillators onto a chip. So it it shows that you can get at physics in a couple of different ways. But it's not really physics; it's mathematical optimization. So uh, uh, let me summarize: they're all based. All these systems are based upon minimum power dissipation. Uh, the physical hardware implements steepest descent, uh, but it produces a binary output because it, you you force it to be binary and the same way that you force a flip-flop to step two states. Um, and the, what's the point of doing this with physics hardware if you can do these optimizations on a conventional computer is that the physics hardware uh, will be at least 10,000 times faster and would consume at least 10,000 times less power because it goes directly to the solution. It doesn't um, move the data from the register, from one register to memory and back and forth no, it goes directly to the solution because it's following a physics principle laid out by Onsager in 1931. So the big question is, where is this going to be used? What's the low-hanging fruit? This is a sort of a funding agency talk for where's the, uh, 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 where's the best initial application just to demonstrate the system. And once you have that initial application, it'll uh, uh, develop the field so that there'll be uh, other applications coming up. Now, uh, there are many physics systems. There's electrical, optical, uh, there's things called comparators, a different type of circuit. It's called the Boltzmann machine. They're all the same. Uh, it's completely clear, uh, I've tried to indicate, why get into something complicated if you can do it electrically and you can scale it as you can with chips and with, uh, get many degrees of freedom. So uh, the, um, I expect this to be reduced to a type of chip called a field programmable gate array. And I expect the application to be in control theory, but this is very controversial. Some people believe that the initial application will be for the Amazon trucks because there's so much money at stake. Other uh, people believe that it has to do with data centers and they optimize their load and so forth. So uh, it's, uh, it's um, an exciting field to be in. I think this is a, a new form of computing directly from physics and uh, it will, um, it will make its mark. It's not going to replace the digital computer, but it'll be terrific for doing very rapid optimization when you're in a real hurry. Okay, let me uh, leave it at that. And I want to welcome questions. Let's see, I have my last slide is uh, just giving you the link to the uh, uh, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences where we showed all the different groups were uh, following the Onsager principle. And it's not exhaustive is that there are some groups that are using the adiabatic method, uh, particularly they have quantum computers that use the adiabatic method, uh, but uh, it also works classically. But those are uh, in a lower proportion than the number of groups who are using uh, the um, uh, the uh, onside of principle. I would say at least 70%, 70 to 80% of the groups trying to make these new types of computers are doing the Onsager principle.